This is the Berlin-Palermo railway axis, a planned 2,200 km long high-speed rail line between Berlin and Palermo. It's designated as one of the main transport links connecting Central and Southern Europe, tracking through Germany, Austria and Italy. It will be priority project number 1 of 30 from the newly updated Trans-European Transport Network Plan, which is part of a grand vision by the EU Green Deal to make all scheduled travel of 500 km or less carbon neutral by 2030 and reduce transport emissions by 90% by 2050. The idea is that if Europe can create a network of modern, super-fast and comfortable trains going between every major city and member states, like this, then it can replace planes for these short to medium distance travel times. Trains, particularly electric passenger trains, are obviously the way to go for this solution. Even accounting for use of fossil fuels in power generation, trains average about a fifth of the greenhouse gas emissions per passenger kilometer of airplanes and less than half that of buses. Take for example Lisbon to Madrid, separated by 624 kilometers. A flight would emit 109 kilograms of CO2, while rail only 23. That's an insane 474% difference. Yet somehow there's no direct train between the two adjacent capitals. So while a plane would just take an hour and 30 minutes of travel, the three connecting train journeys would take around 9 hours. This is where the Madrid Extremadura high speed rail line will come in. Linking Madrid and Barajos, a city close to the Portuguese border, it will eventually be expanded to connect to Lisbon by 2030 via connections to Alvas and Evora. A Madrid Lisbon line by high speed rail would cut the current nine hour train ride to just two and a half, which would actually be shorter than flying when you take into account all the driving and waiting that comes with airports. We've seen this pan out with other lines already. The Eurostar carried nearly 80% of traffic from London to Brussels and Paris. In 2019, while flights between Milan and Rome fell by more than half after a high-speed rail line opened in 2007. Now, while this is the main goal, replacing planes, it's also just about connecting Europe overall by train and giving more options for travel, regardless. For example, with the main line for Europe, it'll be going from Paris to Bratislava. That's a distance of 1,338 kilometers, which doesn't really make sense by train, but it means it'll be connecting big cities like Strasbourg, Stuttgart, Munich, and Vienna along the way, crucial for maintaining being an alternative to planes for any journey whatsoever. It's the same with the rail Baltica, which is priority project Project number 27. The 870 km line will go from Warsaw all the way up to Tallinn, linking the capital cities of Baltic nations Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania to the rest of Europe by the way of the Polish capital by 2030. This is exactly what the trans-European rail networks intend to do, connect Europe. The better European cities are connected by rail, the easier it is to move away from high-polluting transport modes such as aviation and cars. But even further, people need to be more incentivized to use rail. 17 of the 20 most frequented air routes in Europe are for distances less than 700 kilometers. In theory, almost all of these journeys could be shifted to rail. Now, don't get me wrong, the EU already has over 200,000 kilometers of rail infrastructure across the block, and many of its countries have some of the best rail systems in the world. But it's actually not enough right now. I mean, only 11,000 kilometers of these tracks facilitate high-speed rail, and as a result, it isn't used as much as it could be, which I know sounds crazy to say about European countries considering how far ahead they are in rail ridership than almost everywhere else. But while the number of passenger kilometers traveled on the EU's railways rose from 340 billion in 2001 to 413 billion in 2018, rail's overall share of journeys has barely moved, increasing from 6.7% to 7%. In the same period, air travel share rose from 6.1% to 9.6% of all European journeys by passenger kilometers. Even in the most train-happy countries such as Austria and the Netherlands, for example, the figures are just 13% and 11%. Now, there's a few reasons for this, but I believe most of them stem from this. High-speed rail links haven't truly been prioritized in all of Europe, let alone cross-border ones. In 2018, the European Commission found that out of 365 cross-border rail links that had once existed, 149 were non-operational. You see, rail is the form of transport that requires possibly the most coordination, and on a continent split into dozens of countries, there's bound to be tons of problems. Compatibility is a perfect example of this. Europe may have thousands of rail lines, but they are not all created equally. Europe's electric railways use four different voltage levels, while signaling and safety systems are even worse, given almost every country initially had its own. Even the tracks themselves vary. For example, the Baltic countries use Russia's wider gauge, and Spain and Portugal have one of their own. The European Rail Agency has been gradually enforcing common specifications since 1996, but there's still a long way to go in adjusting the current ones or just creating new tracks. 
But besides that, even when international high-speed lines have been built, often at enormous cost, national loyalties, clashing regulations, and bureaucratic hurdles lurking around at pretty much every corner are preventing these routes from fulfilling their potential. The lack of unification also goes beyond the physical world and reaches the digital realms of ticket purchasing sites. Although some privately owned websites already facilitate the sale of cross-border train tickets, there's not even a single united ticketing system yet. The process usually requires customers to go through different national rail websites. Even after the purchase, passengers traveling on various national companies are not guaranteed their connection if the first train from a different railway company is running late. Of course, these things will eventually be fixed. But as a result, currently, you basically end up with countries like Spain and France that have extensive national railway networks, such as the AVE and TGV, yet have remained largely focused on domestic markets for decades. Cross-border trips are basically just a side business and nuisance to them, so going from one country to the other usually means creeping along some old-fashioned tracks. Then there's the financial aspect that pretty much goes hand in hand with this problem. When I said these high-speed lines have been built at an enormous cost, I wasn't exaggerating in the slightest. Despite the fact the EU is budgeting a total of $100 billion worth of rail from 2021 to 2027, it's not close to being enough when high-speed tracks can cost more than $42 million per kilometer. On most routes, countries would actually be better off improving their conventional networks according to the European Court of Auditors. As a result, high-speed rail tickets typically cost far more than a budget airfare on the same route, which again contributes to not enough people using rail. A 2019 climate survey of almost 30,000 people by the European Investment Bank found that 62% of Europeans support a ban on short-haul flights, with the main obstacle being prices. So, the more attractive and easy-to-use rail services are, the more likely it is that people will want to switch. We know this because we've seen the effects of cheap public transport. If you take, for example, the 9 euro ticket that Germany offered during the summer of 2022, in which passengers could travel for 9 euros per month on local and regional transport in all of Germany. It was a wild success. Over 52 million tickets were sold over the three-month period and saved 1.8 million tons of CO2, almost as much as a 130 km per hour speed limit on the autobahns would achieve in an entire year. Now, of course, this 9 euro ticket didn't include high-speed rail, but one could imagine that if it did, the results would be even more insane. Couple this with the fact that the EU plans to double their high-speed rail traffic by 2030 and triple it by 2050, there can really be a set pathway to becoming the world's first carbon-neutral continent by 2050, as the EU aims to do. So, what's happening now, besides all these multi-year projects currently being built and targets being set? Well, even if the EU is decades off from reaching its targets, they're still addressing the problems without having a fully connected high-speed rail system being ready. A growing number of countries have plans to phase out short-haul flights that can be completed by train in a given time frame, and France has recently become the world's first major economy to do so, enacting a nationwide ban on short haul domestic flights on routes where train journeys of two and a half hours or less exist as an alternative. Well, kinda. As a first step, flights will be prohibited on just three routes from Paris's secondary airport, Orly, to Bordeaux, Lyon, and Nantes. And as rail improves, so will the amount of banned flights. There has also been a rise of the air rail connections, meaning instead of a traveler making the usual dash from flight to flight, a small but growing number connect to or from a train for one leg of their journeys. It's again, sort of a band-aid on the problem, but it's something. That's the thing though, no one policy is going to solve the whole problem. You get half a percent here, a tenth of a percent there. But when you do things bit by bit, the result adds up. That is the way for the EU reaching its climate goals and finally changing from no more than a patchwork of national systems to a transport united Europe. Thank you for watching.